Hi, my name is Jeremy Shines, and this is I Am Loved Church. So, good day. I have a message. Uh, this one's been stirring up inside of me for quite some time. Um, I just pray that I have enough material for it. Um, and then to do another one this coming Sunday, God willing. So, whew, it's a good one. It's a good one. I don't really know how to start this one. Um, I guess I'll just start it for wherever, whatever my mind starts to flow. Okay, so Old Testament. For those of you who don't know much about the Bible or hope nothing, I'm going to try my best. Okay, so I want you to imagine this concept of uh, God. He's holy. He's perfect. He's unblemished. Um, there's no darkness inside of him. In the beginning, in Genesis, he separated the darkness from the light, which basically he separated anything evil and dark and confusion and sorrow and grief. He separated that from himself. And he says, I am holy. I am perfect. I am good. I am loving. I am the light. You know, I am eternal. I am just everything that's just good. And everything that's not good is not a part of me. This is the God that we serve. This is the God that created everything. <clears throat> and he didn't create anything to die either. He did not create evil. He separated evil from himself. <clears throat> and then he wanted more. I mean, not more, because he is the fullness. He's eternal. But he wanted uh, children. And he gave us a choice. He says, if you worship me, I will bring you into my goodness. I will show you who I am. So we were created to get to know him. We were created to experience his glory. You know, there are so many good things in this world, you know, <clears throat> but there are so many bad things. And we have a choice to, to get to know him, to find out what pleases him. And what pleases him is doing the right thing. And it also makes us feel good about ourselves. What doesn't please him is to is everything outside of him, which is darkness, which he's already separated. So when Adam and Eve sinned, they basically said, um, you have a moral way of looking at the world, God. The way you reason the world. God reasons the world as well, just like we do. And he has separated how he's reasoned it, good being uh, what's good is inside of him and in his character, and what is bad is outside of him. And he says, if you take of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you will have the ability to redefine right and wrong. Wow, I know. So God already says, this is right and wrong. This is the way and the truth, and this is eternal life, is to really know what real right and wrong is, which is in the Word of God, the Holy Bible. But if you eat of the fruit, you will have free will to redefine what that means. Now, the world that we live in is exactly what human beings has, have done. Each religion that's not According to the Holy Word of God, the Holy Bible, each person has redefined what right and wrong means for themselves. And the God of the Bible says this. Now, their thoughts are unholy. So a lot of people, they have a lot of problems. They, they feel confused. They feel anxiety. They feel grief and depression. And like it just goes on and on and on. And what God is saying, he's saying, unless you adopt the Bible as your way of thinking, as your way of reasoning the world around you, because it's holy and it's perfect, unless you adopt my thinking, which is the word of God, then the way you perceive the world will be, will, won't be good. 
It will be darkness. It will be evil. It will be separation from my presence, which is peace, patience, patience, kindness, goodness, loving, holiness, purity, just this representation of an altar. For those of you who don't know, the altar is a representation of, of his kingdom. It's also a representation of purity and holiness. And when that relationship got broken, when they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, when they redefined right and wrong for themselves, before Jesus arrived, there was a covenant that God was, that had, he had made. The covenant was, I'm going to teach you what right and wrong is, and you are to obey them. And those moral, that moral compass and that moral code is even written in our consciousness. Don't have sex with animals. Don't drink the blood of animals. Um, don't have sex with your siblings. You know, don't steal. Honor your father and your mother. Don't covet after your neighbor's stuff. It's one thing to envy what your neighbor or people have. Another thing is to is to want want it. You know, I'm going to covet after my neighbor's spouse. What basically means not to appreciate your life and you want what everyone else has and you don't feel satisfied until you get what they have. He says those things are evil. Lying is evil. Cheating, stealing, worshiping idols, worshiping things that aren't God, being there's only one God, worshiping the true God and not worshiping you know, your possessions, such as your homes or your vehicles or your, your income or anything else, you know, or even your spouse, but truly honoring and putting God above everything, not making images, not worshiping yourself, making an image. People worship images like the image of Buddha and all these other things or making um, false religions, worshiping knowledge that you can worship basically anything that's not God. So God set a list of rules and more. And this is where we find our moral, um, this is where we have our moral compass. It's our conscience. God created us all in his image. So we all have this moral code inside of us. And when we break that moral code, it's all in the Bible. When we start stepping outside of what God wants us to do, we start to feel grief, anxiety, and pain and anger and all these things and god is basically saying this to us return to me the old testament there was an altar they had to sacrifice and atone for their sins god set a list of rules for us and he says if you break these you have to get a dove or a goat or some sheep or whatever that sacrifice requires so you can get your you can get forgiven and you could be healed of the sin that you committed and for those of you who don't know the laws of god even though you don't know it you're still breaking his laws so if you break one of these laws you the burden that comes on you the veil that comes over you is darkness in pain and suffering or grief or whatever is attached to it. And it also is attached with a dark demonic spirit. But God loves us so much. He sent his only son to take off the veil, to cast out that demon that now lives in us. When we committed those sins to heal us of those, of those uh, things. But we have to, be willing to accept it, to believe it, and to come into repentance, which is basically come and say to God, I'm sorry that I've done these things, and I believe that you're the true God, and I've worshipped myself, or I've worshipped possessions, or I've committed those sins and those actions that the Bible says those are bad and those are not good. And until we accept it and start to put those things into action, then we won't be healed of whatever traumas that we have. I've had lots of traumas in my life. I've, I've committed a lot of sins. I went through down pretty much list for, 
down the list of the sins that I've committed. And I'm like, man, I've pretty much committed all of them. No, I have not slept with animals, but there are people who do. For real. It's, wow. (laughs) So, with that being said, this message is about God wanting to heal you. He's already perfect and holy. He's already uh, full of, of grace and compassion. And when Jesus came in the world, he represented a man who had no veils, being no secrets. A veil is a secret. You tell a lie, you have to tell another one and another one, and then you feel worse and worse every time you tell a lie or every time you sin. The addiction of these things that we have inside of us is God saying those are spirits. There's spirits of anger, there's spirits of jealousy, there's spirits of lusting, there's spirits, all these different spirits. And what they want you to do is they want you to do more sin. They want you to sin more. The more you sin, the more you desire to sin. But when you turn from your sin, you turn to God. He forgives you of your sin, but he also allows you uh, uh, power and authority to not go back into those sins. So when they ate of the fruit, they leaned on their own understanding. They've redefined right and wrong. But God is saying right and wrong never changed, even if you reason it differently than, than the word of God. You can change, you can reason this world and say, well, God doesn't exist. His right and wrong and his rules don't exist. So basically, I don't have to obey them because I can become God of my own reasoning of how I perceive the world of what right and wrong should be. But just because you do that does not mean that he is not relevant, does not mean that he doesn't exist and his word and and, and his laws don't exist. They still exist. You're just rebelling. That's all that is. That's just rebellion. Your conscience, which God fabricated, he knitted you together and he put his word inside your heart, bears witness. So when you hear this message, it makes total sense because it's his word. He's taught me his word and teaches me daily what right is and what wrong is. And when I do sin, I repent of my sin. His word can't be changed and it can't be manipulated. You can't add or take away from it. Jesus is a representation of this man who wore no veils. He had no secrets. He was completely naked. And as we were completely naked before God, and that's what heaven is like, is to be naked before God. King David, he was so anointed with God's grace, with his mercy. He was dancing around naked. In the book of Genesis, they were completely naked before each other, and they weren't ashamed of each other, Adam and Eve. And God came to restore what was lost. He came to bring us back into that presence. If I walked around naked outside, I would get arrested because of indecency. Is it really indecency? Or are we indecent people? The way we perceive the world. I've had people complain about me or said I've done stuff to them that I've never even known they were even existing. I wasn't even paying attention. I was accused, basically, of things that I've never even were aware of. Does that mean that it's true? Or is that person living in so much sin where they perceive the world the way they want to perceive it? I'm sure if you're a man or a woman, you can perceive someone saying, oh, they were hitting on me. And you go to that person, they go, were you hitting on me? And they're like, what? I even wasn't even paying attention to you. I don't even know what. What? So what does that mean? What Jesus is saying, you need to look at your own heart. 
That's what he's saying. When you're judging the world, is it just your, isn't it just your imagination? Is it true or are you just believing it? Because that's what's, that sin is living inside of you, telling you how to think. It creates confusion when you live in sin. People hate me over here. Or people are thinking about me like this. And Jesus is saying, you need to look at your own heart before you believe those things. I know somebody who cheated on their spouse. And ever since that person cheated on their spouse, the spouse that did not actually cheat on them, they would accuse of and say, you're cheating on me. And the spouse would be like, what are you talking about? I'm not cheating on me. I'm not cheating on you. I've never cheated on you. What are you talking about? I love you. And the other person who actually cheated on them is saying, no, you cheated on me. I know you did. And you're like, I didn't cheat on you. What, are you. what are you talking about? No, you did. No, you did. Whereas this person actually did cheat on them. This person over here cheated on them. And this person over here did not cheat on that person. They're like, I didn't cheat on you. This person's like, yes, you did when this person did it. Are you accusing of, are you accusing people, other people of what you did? And Jesus said, look at your own self. Look at the finger that you point. I've seen this happen multiple times, not just with that. Someone, someone was like, oh, this person has mental problems, pointing the finger. Whereas this person's like, hey, what are you talking about? I know you've got problems. And this person was going to a, to a therapy. <laughs> Whereas this person's totally just minding their own business. The other day I had someone tell me. They were telling me, like, thinking that I was calling them stupid or something. You think I'm stupid and you think that da, 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 da. And I'm over here like, I have no idea what you're talking about. This is the first time I've heard that. No, you've done this to me. Da, da, da. And I'm like, what? Are you doing that to others? And if others are doing that to you, you should pray for them. The fact that we point fingers at other people, it means that we're living in sin. The only person who can point fingers at other people is God. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, you're pointing fingers at us. That's why you do these videos. So you need to look at your own heart. Take a look at it real quick like this. When we believe in Christ and put our faith and our trust in him, what actually happens is his spirit comes upon us. God's spirit lives through us. So everything that I'm saying, if I'm aware of what I'm saying, I know what I know by my own experiences. But whatever is convicting you has nothing to do with me. This is a video. I don't even know who's watching it. But God knows who will watch it and who is watching it. So if you're feeling something that has nothing to do with me, that's the Holy Spirit working on you and saying he's right and you need to repent. If you're a believer and you live in the midst of non-believers or people who are even believers, it doesn't matter. If you believe in God and you're walking with him every day, you're going to be judging people even though you're not doing anything or saying anything to them. They're going to be convicted by the way you live your life and what you say. A conviction means exposed, to be exposed for your sins. If everyone is wearing these veils, if, you've, if you're familiar with the Muslim culture, women have to wear veils over themselves. The only person who can see them were their parents. Maybe their kids, I don't know. And their husband, naked. But everybody else, if somebody else saw there's that woman naked, she would be killed. What Jesus does is he basically tears the veil. 
He tears the veils of all these lies. Straight through all the lies. Straight through all the all the uh, deceit and the evil. He tears it right open when he dies on the cross. And he says, anyone who wants to see the truth, anyone who wants to be healed, anyone who wants to have eternal life and be filled with my spirit and my love and my joy and all the goodness that comes with God, you have to take off your veil. This isn't just for women. Imagine the whole world wearing these veils. They clothe themselves with their own perception of what the world should look like. Unless you're like me, you won't be accepted. And each and every person is doing that. But so is God. And he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Unless you abandon your philosophy, your way of thinking, your religion, unless you abandon this world and its, and its persona of thought and completely lean on the word of God for your way of thinking, you will never enter into the kingdom of heaven because the kingdom of heaven is where God is, and this Bible is how he thinks. Pharisees, they clothe themselves in lies. They clothe themselves in identity to the world. But they don't clothe themselves with the word of God. They don't clothe themselves by their faith in Jesus. So one of the things that God showed me was this. This is what you worship. When you go through times of distress, you lose a family member, or your spouse is hurting you, or you don't have money, and you're struggling. Whatever you go through, what do you substitute to give you comfort? What comforts you when you go through times of distress? Is it your spouse? Is it your friends? Is it your pastor? Is it, a, is it something that you do shopping or selling things? What do you do that comforts you? Drinking alcohol, doing drugs? He says, that is your salvation and that is your God. When Jesus refers to the Father, he's referring to the ultimate provider. When we read through the book, such as like Psalms, and he says, when the birds wake up from their nests and they're looking for food, they cry out to God. And God provides for them. And he points the direction where they'll find food. The same thing happens with any and everything that we do. Where do you find your happiness? Where do you find your joy? If you don't find your joy in Christ, then you're worshiping this world. When you look at children, when they need something, they go to their parents. Who do you go to when you need something? Do you go to your pastor? Do you go to your parents? Do you go to your spouse? Do you go to your friends? Do you go to uh, society, the government? Jesus, when he says, give to Caesar back to Caesar's what's his and give to God back to God what's his. We see this in society. We see that people, they run to everything, but they don't run to God. When we look at Jesus' life, he ran to God for everything. When we look at David's life, he was a man after God's own heart. He ran to God for everything. Whatever he was dealing with, he ran to him. He prayed to God. 
which basically means he had a relationship with him. And God does the same for us. Do you run to books when you seek knowledge or wisdom? Do you run to anything else? He's basically, Jesus is saying, you have a father in heaven who cares about you. Stop running to everyone and everything else and run to me. I know that there's false religions. They lean on their own understanding. People who lean on their own understanding. But they never run to me. This is what will be judged on the last day. Did you run to God like a child? Did you run to Jesus? Or did you just call up your pastor? Or did you just call up this person? Or leaned on somebody or something else like alcohol or drugs? When you face temptations, you Christians, you face temptations. Who do you run to? Do you just go into the temptation? Or do you cry out to God? Everything, God takes care of everything. He takes care of the stars, the moons, the whole universe he takes care of. He even takes care of the world. But he gives us a choice. He says you can lean on your own understanding. You can look to this world to provide for you. And I promise you it will not provide for you. It will lead you into debt. It will lead you into poverty it'll lead you into destruction and worshiping idols and sinning to find your joy in sin or if you come to me i will lead you into eternal joy eternal peace eternal love eternal happiness yes you will still have struggles but you will no longer lean to the world or its way of understanding, you will lean to God. I am your father. I am your ultimate provider. I provide for everything. Will I not provide for you? You of little faith. The concept of this relationship, what was broken in the garden when they ate of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, they cut off that provider. They cut off God as their provider and they became their own provider. But God is saying, if you are called by my name or you want to be in my family, you have to stop leaning on your own understanding. You, stop, you have to stop looking to this world as, as your fortress. David says this so many times, Lord, you are my fort, whatever he needed, you are, you are my shield, you are my fortress, you are my tent, you clothe me when the enemy shoots arrows with their tongues in the daytime. Anything and everything David needed, including when he intentionally fell into sin, he looked to God, he said, God, you are my righteousness, I'm not my own righteousness. God, you are my righteousness. Do you do that? Do you cry out to God like a child? God, I'm not holy. I'm not righteous. You are holy. You are righteous. You are my righteousness. You are my perfecter. You are my creator. You are my provider when I am in distress. When I am in grief, you are my everything. Anything and everything that I need, I Put my trust in you. Do you do that? Don't you want that relationship? And he says, that's faith right there. A person who took off all the shame, all the doubt, and says, the world doesn't define me. My past doesn't define me. My sins don't define me. People's opinions don't define me. This world will never define me. God, you define me. The world will constantly tell us that you're not loved. I am loved. God loves me. I'm not smart enough. 
I'm not smart. I don't need to be smart. God is my, is my education. God is my wisdom. I trust in him to supply what I need. All Paul talks about it and he says, all the treasures of treasures that you could ever want, they're found in Christ. And anything outside of Christ, we see people trying to earn it. They never feel good enough unless they, they have all these accomplishments under their belt or have all this money in their account. And they still never feel good enough when they obtain those things. And that's what Jesus describes as gaining the whole world and losing your own soul. Even when you have all those things, you still never feel whole or complete. When Jesus is simply saying, come to me, let me fill you, let me complete you. I created you, let me finish what I started. That's the question that we have for us today. Do you trust, do you trust him to let go? Let go of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Let go of your reasoning. Let go of your understanding. Let go of your possessions. Let go of your goals and your dreams and aspirations. Just completely let go. Because what's hurting you and why your life is the way it is and getting worse is because you keep holding on when you need to let it go and surrender. God doesn't put people in hell. People choose hell. When all they got to do is let go and let God be God. You did not create yourself. You don't know who you are or where you're going. But the one who created you, he knows who you are and where you should go. And until you let go of all this baggage, let go of your understanding, you will never find wholeness and completeness and peace in your life. It's a struggle. Trusting him, letting go. Let go of your possessions. Let go of the things that, let go of everything. Let go of your mind, your body. Surrender your body to God. Surrender everything. Your family, your wife, your kids, surrender it all. Surrender your schooling. Because that's what God wants. He wants your whole life. Because he loves you. And he knows what's good for you. You can't number the dirt on this earth, but he can. You can't see your future, but he can. And he knows exactly where you need to go and what you need to do. And until you do what he wants you to do, until you surrender, your life and the people in it and everything that you understand about it will never be good enough, even if you obtain the whole world. This relationship that we enter into with God, it's all about re restoring what was lost. But everyone's broken my heart, so I don't trust people. Rightfully so. But you didn't even think about it and you took a breath. And that was a gift from God. If he so much clothes you in your skin, in your spirit, and he clothes you in his breath, 
You can breathe because he allows you to. You can see the sun came up today on time as it's always came up on time every day. And you see the stars and the moon, even though you don't understand how they work. And you're not more, you're not powerful enough to even hold them into place. Surely, he can take care of you. Unconditionally, all he wants you to do is to believe. Believe in the cross, believe that it's finished. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to be everything and obtain all your goals. All you have to do is believe. Surrender all those things. And have what you really want. Peace. And love. Thank you so much for watching. God bless.